So people are still joining in. Let's uh, perhaps just wait a couple of minutes more. Oh yeah, yeah. you're all right. I just closed my window. Let me just close the door there as well. We are live. All set. I think that most people is already here. Okay, so we have, uh, well, the number of attendees is still increasing, right? So people are joining in now, but I guess we can, uh, well, we can start, I guess. Agree, uh, Fernando? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Well, okay, so, um, well, um, Good morning, every, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the to the summer school. So uh, it's my pleasure here today to introduce uh, Stefan Riesler, so a very good friend of the summer school. Uh, Stefan is currently um, full professor at uh, Heidelberg University. Uh, so he, he there he leads the um, Statistical Natural Language Processing Group. Um, well, his research focuses on interactive machine learning for uh, NLP problems. So he's especially been working on applications like information retrieval, information extraction, uh, conversational search, uh, machine translation as well. So he's actively engaged in the community. So he has served different roles. He's, uh, for instance, editorial board member of uh, important uh, journals uh, in the field. And he has also published uh, extensively on his uh, areas of interest. Over the years, of course, he has also uh, accumulated several distinctions, awards, um, research grants uh, 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 that are very competitive from companies like Google and, and Amazon. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are also familiar with uh, some of his work. His lecture here today will address uh, the topic of uh, reinforcement learning. So Stefan will be using uh, pre-recorded lectures. Um, well, but maybe at the beginning, uh, you would like to say a few words and introduce uh, the lecture as well. So Stefan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody worldwide. Uh, so the lectures, uh, I'm using uh, today are the same lectures as last year. So I didn't change anything. I, I want to uh, change them for the next round when we are still, uh, when we hopefully will be live again. And uh, so I think uh, it, it, it's not like that they're outdated. It's just uh, if you have been here last year or if you have seen the lecture from last year, nothing changed. But uh, it's still uh, state-of-the-art reinforcement learning with applications to NLP. That's, the, that's one of the important focuses of, of the work. Um, something that you won't see in other reinforcement learning lectures, which are mostly for robotics and other applications, not for NLP. And, I hope you enjoy the lecture and we will have two breaks where you can ask questions in after roughly one hour each. And uh, yeah, I will see you there again. Thank you. All right, so welcome everybody. So I have the pleasure to introduce you to the topic of reinforcement learning. So my name is Stefan Rietzler. I'm at the Computational Linguistics and Computer Science Department in Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, what the talk will be about is seven 
different topics and uh, I will structure the talk into three blocks. The first block is on the oldest techniques, uh, namely the setup of reinforcement learning via Markov decision processes and uh, dynamic programming techniques and sampling based techniques. Then we will take a break and uh, you will have time to ask uh, questions in a live session. And after that, uh, we will talk about policy gradient techniques and how they are used in sequence to sequence learning. So that's the, 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 main, uh, the mainstay of techniques that are used in sequence to sequence learning. And then we will have another uh, Q&A session. And after that, we will talk about how to get away from uh, simulations to learning, reinforcement learning from human feedback. So, and we will have to talk about off policy learning, counterfactual learning, and how to deal with noisy human feedback. Okay. So the textbooks that I can recommend is uh, first uh, the, the well-known Sutton book. So it, uh, it, the first uh, edition came out in 1998 and uh, now there's a new edition that includes a lot of new material and uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a textbook that doesn't require a lot of uh, mathematics, but it also doesn't include a lot of mathematics. So there is no proofs in the book. So if you are interested in proofs for the theorems, how, why certain algorithms converge and, and, and so on and so forth, then you have to look in the uh, book of uh, Shaba Shepiswari or an even older book that uh, gives even more uh, proofs by Bartzekas and Tsitsiklis, and the book is called Neurodynamic Programming. So it, it's just another title for uh, reinforcement learning. So at that time in 1996, the, the, the name reinforcement learning was not yet established uh, in machine learning. So, but uh, you can see it neurodynamic means uh, they are talking about neural networks and uh, programming techniques for neural networks via reinforcement learning and mostly about uh, non-convex optimization problems, which are reinforcement learning problems mostly are. Okay, so what's the philosophy behind uh, reinforcement learning? So from one perspective, reinforcement learning uh, describes a hedonistic learning system. So what that means is it's a learning system that are is not given uh, instructions by a teacher or by a supervisor, but it's a system that wants something and adapts its behavior to maximize uh, a reward signal from the environment. So it's basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a learning framework where you have an agent and an environment. And uh, so it's, uh, as I say in the second uh, point, uh, bullet point, it's an interactive learning scenario where an agent uh, tries out uh, certain actions via trial and error and uses the consequences of his own or her own actions in uncharted territory to learn to maximize the expected reward. And from a, uh, from a machine learning perspective, uh, this is learning from weak supervision signals. So it's, it's something in between unsupervised learning and supervised learning and early textbooks on machine learning explicitly excluded reinforcement learning as a, a different kind of animal that doesn't really fit into this framework of unsupervised and supervised learning because it's an interactive learning scenario. But it's, it's well established uh, nowadays and uh, there is a connection to supervised learning via imitation learning. We will talk about it in the very end and yeah. So, but uh, keep in mind, it's an interactive learning scenario. So interactive means, so this is how uh, David Silver from Google DeepMind would like to see reinforcement learning. So you have an intelligent agent symbolized by a brain that uh, performs an action that affects a real world environment that rewards the agent who performed the action 
and puts the whole system, so the environment and the agent, because the agent is affected by the environment in a new state. And given this new state, there are the agent performs the next action and uh, gets a new reward and so on. So the goal is to, as we said before, uh, to maximize the expected reward for a series of actions. So uh, an example from natural language processing. So this is a natural language processing uh, uh, summer school and uh, is uh, machine translation and interactive machine translation can be formalized as a reinforcement learning problem by looking at the translation system as the agent. And the translation system performs an action by predicting a target word or a target token a target character depending on what what system we have and a human user or a human or uh, a, a user of the translation system rewards the proposed translation by uh, giving some kind of per sentence translation quality judgment or per word translation quality judgment and the state in in uh, of the of the system now is we have uh, the source sentence and the target history of what we have produced so far. And given from, from this uh, produced target history, we can predict the next word and uh, see what, uh, what reward we get and, and, and continue. So we will come back to uh, a lot of experiments are uh, in the area of machine translation because that's the area I'm working on and uh, it, it's a uh, scenario that everybody uh, should know or it's, it's easy to understand so you don't have to know a lot of linguistics and so on it's just you know, source sentence translation and sequence to sequence learning in between all right so to uh, make this a little bit more formal by introducing some uh, variables so the reinforcement learning uh, schema, uh, so the, the, the variables we are using is, uh, we have an agent or system, in, in our case, the agent is a machine translation system and uh, an environment, in our case, it's the user, a human user, uh, that interact at a sequence of T time steps where the agent receives a state representation, which is, uh, denoted by S, on which base it selects an action, which is denoted by A, and we receive some reward, and the notation is RT plus one, so we, uh, we, we will uh, look at uh, rewards that we get when we perform an action, given a state, and we are in the next state, so that's it's a why it's called RT plus one, and because in the new state, ST plus one, we receive this reward. So there are different uh, conventions to denote the reward by RT instead of RT plus one, but that's the, uh, the notation we, we will stick to uh, in this lecture. Okay, the goal is to maximize the total amount of reward that an agent can receive in such uh, interactions in the long run. So the standard uh, uh, setup for uh, formalizing the user side or the environment side is as a Markov decision process. So what is a Markov decision process? It's a, a tuple of states and actions and very importantly, a state transition probability matrix that tells you given a state A, a state S and an action A, what is the next state? What's the probability of uh, going to the next state? And a reward function, which is defined as the expected reward that you get from going from state S to state S T plus one and uh, having seen action A. So we will uh, shortly get a more formal definition of these two very important uh, 
ingredients of the state transition probability matrix and reward function. So we, we can boil down uh, the definition of these two to a very simple probability function. So, but first let's look at, uh, yeah, that's what we do here. This is the probability function uh, P of S prime R given S A. That can be uh, the basis of all uh, the whole dynamics of the environment under the Markov, uh, for, for the Markov decision process under the Markov property. So why is it called a Markov decision process? Because we are, as you see in the conditional probability here, we are not uh, taking other uh, states and actions that have been seen in time t minus one or earlier into account. So we are making a Markov assumption that the probability of a new state and the reward is only dependent on the state and action that we have immediately uh, performed before. Okay, so how can we now uh, specify the uh, state transition probability matrix and the rewards in terms of this uh, simple probability distribution? So the first question is, state transition probability matrix, right? So it's the probability of new state given old state and action. So if we have this probability function here, then uh, the solution is easy. We just marginalize over the rewards. So that's an important concept. So it means that uh, you are not, uh, it's not necessary that every state is uh, uh, associated with one deterministic reward. So you can get uh, to, a, to a new state by different ways and uh, collect uh, different rewards by going there. So it's basically you, you have to uh, take the, uh, the marginal probability distribution of this joint distribution of states and rewards by collecting all possible rewards that you could get by going from one state via one action to a next state. Okay, so the next uh, problem is how to formalize the reward function, which is here defined uh, as the expected reward given state and action. So what's, this, what's the expectation? That's the main question. Well, the definition is we have the expectation over our state reward pairs. That's the probability distribution that we take the expectation over and the reward function that we, is, is our uh, random variable that we take the expectation of. Okay, so that gives you a clear understanding what the state or transition probability matrix is and what uh, the reward uh, distribution is. Okay, so, so far we only covered the side of the environment or user. Now we are interested in how can we formulate the agent or the system. And this is done by so-called policies. And uh, the most general case of a policy is a stochastic policy, which is a distribution over actions given states. And this completely specifies the behavior of an agent. Okay, so policies are uh, parametrized. So in the olden days, they were mostly linear models. Now it's uh, deep reinforcement learning just means that the policies are deep neural networks. And since the goal is to uh, maximize your expected reward, what you do is you maximize the parameters of the policy that uh, determines the actions because the actions will uh, give you the reward. Okay, so what we will uh, look at is two different uh, types of problems uh, in reinforcement learning. So one is called policy evaluation and the other one policy optimization. So policy evaluation is also known as prediction in uh, some textbooks or in, uh, and policy optimization is called learning or control. So it's just to make sure that you understand what control means. I mean, yeah. So policy evaluation means 
are you have a, a policy given and you want to know what's the expected reward for a given policy. So it's basically you, you are comparing different policies with, with each other. Which policy gives me the best expected reward? This is, it, it's basically, it, it's, it's, not, it's not learning. It, it, it's a, as a learning in the sense of optimizing parameters of the policy. This is policy optimization or control. So you want to find the optimal policy. So that's the main machine learning problem. You want to optimize the parameters of a parametric policy under the expected reward criteria. Okay, but those two are related, evaluation and optimization, and especially in uh, the, the techniques that we, that we will look at now, the dynamic programming and uh, Monte Carlo and, and so on techniques, they always have they provide techniques for doing both policy evaluation and policy optimization. So another, uh, so here we will look at three, three more uh, important uh, definitions. So one is the definition of uh, the total discounted return. So it's uh, denoted by G sub T. It's basically it's the returns or the rewards for a sequence of actions and states. And uh, it's a, called total, total discounted return because we have a parameter gamma, which is between zero and one. That is, uh, that uh, gets smaller and smaller the farther away we get from our uh, point in time T. So what the, the idea is that uh, rewards that you get later on in, uh, in, 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 your, uh, in, in your action sequence are weighted less than rewards that you get immediately. So immediate rewards are the most important ones, RT plus one, and uh, two steps away is, is also important, but at the very end, uh, you have a very small uh, discount factor gamma that are uh, tells you that a reward that is far away in the future is not really that important to make a decision right now, but it is still uh, taken into account. Then we have to uh, know what action value and state value functions are. So the action value function is denoted by Q and it is the expected total discounted return given a state action pair. And the state value function is the expectation of the action value function over all actions. So that's, it's basically defined only for a state. And here you have a state action pair. The expected uh, discounted return for state action pair and state value function is expected uh, return that you can get for in a particular state, uh, irrespective of what kind of actions you are performing in that state. All right. So one of the key ingredients of uh, the tabular techniques for reinforcement learning, so they are called tabular as we will see, because they require uh, tables of state transition probabilities and reward uh, probabilities. So they, they require to know the whole uh, the whole environment and uh, everything. So basically, we have to have all uh, all the ingredients of our of our model. We have to have it in place, and we have to touch all of the ingredients in learning. And uh, if we have this uh, th th this kind of uh, scenario where we know all the state transition probabilities and all the rewards then what we can do is we can decompose the state value function into an immediate reward and a discounted value of the successor state. So the value function was the expected uh, discounted return for a given state. So this is the immediate reward and the value that you get once you are moving from state S into state ST plus one. It's a, a quite, simple, it's quite simple idea. So it's, it's, uh, that's basically the idea of dynamic programming. 
So you are decomposing a problem into uh, things that you already know and things that are lying in the future. And this is the things that you already know, uh, RT plus one, and this is what you, what you have in the future. And then recursively, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you can replace one by the other and, and basically go farther in the future, use the value function of the, uh, of the history and compute the value function of the future. So this is just uh, the formal definition of what we have here in terms of uh, the, uh, the probability functions that we have seen before. So it's uh, an expectation over all actions. The expectation with respect to pi means we take the, uh, the policy distribution of our uh, rewards given state action pairs and moving from state A, uh, from state S with action A into state S prime for all states S prime, what is the value that we get in state S prime? And uh, a convenient notation uh, for what we have, what we see here is uh, to basically write down the matrix directly. So, uh, the R matrix is written down as uh, the rewards for every state, if we have N states and the probability, the state uh, transition probability matrix is also written down as a matrix where you, going from state one to state one, from state one to state N, from up to going from state N to state N, and uh, the values that you have in all these states. So, if we now have this nice uh, matrix formulation of the uh, recursive equation, then we can think about how to solve uh, this problem for uh, our uh, value function. Because that's what we are interested in uh, policy evaluation. So we want to know what is the value given a particular policy, right? So the value of new pi. And uh, it can be done one way of doing it is by solving linear equations uh, of the Bellman expectation equation directly. So this is the solution. And as you can see, what we have here is we have uh, a matrix inversion and uh, this will limit our uh, up the applicability of this uh, technique to uh, small problems. Because the if the matrix is large and if, if the then uh, this will be infeasible, yeah? So let's uh, go a step back and uh, let, uh, let's think about how we got there. So if you, if you want to do an exercise yourself, if, if you want to understand uh, what, we, what we have discussed so far, then maybe it's a good idea. So I will present the solutions on the slides, but uh, you know that the blue stuff is, is exercises, how to derive this uh, equation, this solution from the Bellman expectation equation. So what we had here is uh, the equation that uh, V pi is our R pi plus gamma P pi plus V pi. How do we get to this form? Well, this is the solution. That's the original form. Then we rewrite the form by using the identity matrix and then uh, we divide by what we have here on this side by matrix inversion. And that's the solution to our problem. And this will make clear to you that, yeah, it's a matrix inversion. This is uh, problematic if you have large uh, scenarios. Okay, so a better solution to the whole uh, scenario is uh, if you have larger problems is dynamic programming, namely an iterative application of the Bellman expectation equation. So what, you, what we see here is we have the same definition as before, but we are indexing uh, VK and VK plus one. So that's basically the idea of uh, reusing things that you, that you know that in, are in the history to compute the future. You're, you're reusing uh, VK to compute VK plus one and recursively 
you can do this. Okay, so what this does is it performs dynamic programming by the recursive de uh, definition of the Bellman expectation uh, equation. And the nice thing is it can be parallelized. So you can, you can compute uh, this form here for every state separately, yeah, if you have a large number of states. So thus it's applicable to large MVPs. But still, you have to know all states and all, uh, all rewards. But you can parallelize it, and so it's, it's, uh, it, it gets around the problem of uh, inverting a large matrix. Okay, so, so far we talked about uh, policy evaluation. Now let's talk about policy optimization. So the, the equivalent to the Bellman expectation equation is the so-called Bellman optimality equation. And uh, the Bellman optimality equation uh, makes use of a very simple trick, namely what we want to have is we want to find an optimal policy, pi star, and uh, we can find that by maximizing over the optimal action value function, Q star. And how do we do that? We are just greedily taking the action that maximizes the optimal action value function and we have the optimal policy. So basically what we, will, what, we, what we need to find is we need to find the optimal action value function. Then we have a recipe of doing policy optimization, right? By just taking the greedy action from the optimal action value function. And how is this done? There's again uh, a recursive definition that tells us that uh, Q star is recursively defined as the, as the expectation over pi star of the immediate reward plus the discount of the maximal action, the action that maximizes the optimal action value function. So we are, we are basically uh, in, in including this greedy uh, action into our recursive equation. So the only difference to the expectation equation here is that we are not taking the expectation, but we are taking a, a maximization step here. And uh, this maximization step makes uh, the Bellman optimality equation uh, non-convex. So uh, we, 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 can't, we can't find uh, a, a direct solution anymore. So we have to recur to uh, dynamic programming or iterative solutions. And uh, the iterative solution, so it, it, there's no closed form solution for this Bellman expectation equation. It's nonlinear. Nonlinear, non-convex. And the iterative solutions, as you can uh, easily imagine, is just we are indexing QK and QK plus one. So we are basically uh, applying the same dynamic program trick as before. We are using what we know to compute the future. And uh, what I don't show here, but what, what you can find, for example, in the Bertzekas and Tsitsiklis book, this here converges to Q star in the same way as the Bellman uh, expectation equation, um, where is it? Converges to V pi. So we get uh, the, uh, the value of a particular policy using the uh, dynamic programming version of the Bellman expectation equation, and we get the optimal policy by using the recursive version of the Bellman optimality equation. All right, so to summarize, dynamic programming algorithms are the earliest algorithms uh, that uh, gave a well-defined convergence uh, for uh, RL algorithms. So the, uh, the idea is uh, it, it's all behind the Bellman ex, uh, equations that uh, allow you to recursively decompose uh, the solution, also the, uh, the, the objective for iterative evaluation. And you can do evaluation and policy optimization. And the nice thing for the, uh, in the iterative solutions, they can be trivially parallelized or even ran asynchronously. And as we said before, uh, 
the problem is we need to know a full MVP model with all transitions and rewards, and we need to touch all of them in learning. So for large uh, problems, this is not, not a good idea. Even if we get around the matrix inversion, we still have a, a large problem. And some, sometimes uh, we don't even know all transitions and rewards. So what, what can we do then? So the solution to uh, this problem is Monte Carlo techniques, Monte Carlo sample. So what do you do in order to do policy evaluation with Monte Carlo techniques? What you do is you sample episodes. Episodes is, is, is a sequence of state action reward triples, right? So for state S0 and action S0, you get a reward S, uh, S1 by going to the next state and then you perform the next action, get a reward, uh, getting, going to the next state and so on and so forth. And for the sampled episodes, what you do is you increment a counter that tells you how often have you seen a state in these sampled episodes and what was the reward that I got for this state. And you can estimate the mean return by just dividing the, uh, the, uh, the returns that you get by the number of uh, seen uh, of, of occurrences of the state. So uh, these techniques of uh, Monte Carlo sampling, they are in difference to the techniques that we have seen before, they are called model free because uh, we don't know the, uh, the Markov decision process, which is the model. We can sample under a policy. All we have to know is a policy. And we can start from, uh, from uh, for, for, for policy optimization, as we, as, as we will see, we, will, we can start from, an, from a non-optimal policy and get up to an optimal policy by sampling and improving. So there are, there, there are different, uh, different uh, parameters, parameters that you can tune with Monte Carlo sampling, namely, when are the updates done? Are they done at uh, every time you visit a state or the first time only you visit a state? And uh, how are the, uh, how are the, uh, the states initialized and so on and so forth. We will not go into any details. You will uh, have to look them up in the Bartzekas book or in the Sutton book. Uh, all we can say, this is also uh, a technique that converges to VPI for uh, policy evaluation. Now uh, let's make uh, this a little bit uh, more efficient and uh, improve these techniques. And what we need to do this is uh, we need the idea of how the incremental mean is uh, defined. So because what we are doing here is we are, we are just uh, computing means, right? So the incremental mean is defined by taking the definition of mean, mu k, pulling out one element of the sum then uh, we are rewriting the sum here from one to k minus one as mu k minus one. So we have to multiply by k minus one to get this term here. And then we can see that uh, we can rewrite the whole uh, equation from mu k as mu k minus one plus one over k, this one element minus mu k minus one. So it's basically, it's, uh, what have we seen so far plus the new element in difference to what we have seen so far normalized. And we can use this idea to improve our Monte Carlo estimate in the following way. So we, we are doing incremental Monte Carlo policy evaluation. So what we do is for each sampled episode, for each step, we are incrementing our state counter and we are not waiting until the, uh, until the very end to collect our, our, uh, our values. But what we do incrementally is we use the idea of the incremental mean to uh, update our, our value counter by the old value counter plus uh, a normalization constant alpha of the immediate uh, reward or, or the immediate return we get minus uh, the value that we, that we have at the moment. 
So this will be exactly the idea of the incremental uh, return if we replace alpha by one over uh, the number of states, right? So if we go back, yeah, this was the, the, the definition was mu k is mu k minus one plus one over k. One over k is one over n here. And uh, x k minus mu k minus one is g t minus the value of state s t. So it's just a, it's a straightforward application of the uh, incremental mean. And uh, we can uh, fiddle around with this by setting alpha to another value that is greater than zero. Maybe things will get better or, or, or worse or faster or slower. Yeah. Okay. So wh why is this important? Why is this, uh, why is this useful? So the idea of the, uh, of the incremental Monte Carlo update allows us to uh, to change several uh, several parts of the procedure. So we, we could, for example, so as we did here, we could say we, we don't want to use one over n as in the in the in the in the definition of the incremental mean. We we want to use another alpha. We we can we want to look at alpha as a learning rate, right? How big is the step that we are taking? So maybe this alpha is 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 even moving or it's uh we can, we can set up different uh, schedules. Then uh, another idea is uh, what we could do is we could maybe if uh, GT is not available, the immediate return, what we could, uh, or, 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 or GT is the expected return. We could, we, we could maybe simplify this by using something else. Or if the, if the value function is, uh, if, if we don't really trust the value function, we could, we could take an estimate of the value function if the, if the, if the value function that we have so far learned on, on, on the sampled episode is not trustworthy. We can, we can take expectations or we can just uh, replace all these parts and with the main goal of reducing variance. Because one of the problems of the Monte Carlo uh, techniques is uh, they are, uh, they have high variance. So this is, this is uh, what's behind uh, all these techniques for uh, temporal difference learning. So what is, uh, what is the first step in temporal difference learning? What we are doing is we are not taking what we had before, gt minus v. We are taking rt plus one plus gamma of v minus v. So what's the difference now? We are not taking uh, the, the expected return from uh, step t to the end, but what we are doing is we are taking an estimate of this, right? So what we are doing is we are combining sampling and recursive computation by, by using the estimated return of rt plus one plus uh, our discounted value for that state. So it's, uh, you can look at it from two ways. So one way is we are, we are combining the dynamic programming techniques that we have seen before into, uh, into, into the sampling procedure. And another way of looking at it is uh, we are taking an estimate and estimates always, if they are good estimates, always reduce the variance of the procedure. So uh, the, uh, the notation here is, is, is important. This part here that replaced our uh, discounted return is called uh, the TD target, temporal difference target. And uh, the whole equation, the target minus uh, the current value is called the TD error. So you, you, what you do is uh, you compare your current value to an estimate of the future error. And uh, so now what is, what is the difference? How, how far are, uh, how far are they apart? This is basically the temporal difference error. And uh, what comes in the following is different techniques to get better estimates of the temporal difference error by improving the different, uh, the TD target or other things, yeah? So the first uh, idea is that we don't want to just look one step ahead in doing our estimate of the return. 
which is what we did here, right? RT plus one plus the value that we will, uh, that we are expecting in uh, the next state. But we want to look uh, a few steps more ahead, maybe even n steps, right? So we are looking uh, ahead as many steps as we can, probably. Maybe that's the restriction, or maybe, maybe, maybe we say, well, uh, looking too many steps ahead is, is, is not a good idea anyway, because they will be discounted. But uh, that's, uh, it, it's a parameter that we can change. We can change the look ahead that we are doing in estimating our return. And this is called TD learning with n-step returns, or n-step TD learning. So the notation here is uh, we are using a, a sub superscript here and the superscript tells us uh, how many steps we uh, look ahead. Yeah, it's gt up to uh, brackets n. So question, how can the incremental Monte Carlo techniques that we uh, presented a few slides before this year, how can this be uh, seen as a special case of uh, TD learning with n-step returns. So GTN is uh, where we look ahead up to uh, the n-step and look at the value for n-step plus t. So how can we uh, see incremental Monte Carlo as a special case of that? So incremental Monte Carlo did never use any value function. Right? So what we basically do is we can see Monte Carlo as our GT up to the infinity. So we are basically going to the very end of our episode, right? And our approximation of GT is the actual GT. We are taking the discounted uh, sum of uh, our immediate returns or immediate rewards. Okay, so this is one, uh, one, uh, one way of uh, improving TD learning by doing n-step returns. Another way of uh, uh, improving TD learning is, uh, which is known as TD lambda by lambda weighted returns. And the idea of TD lambda is, uh, is simply that you want to average the n-step returns. So you're taking n-step returns and you take an average. So GT lambda means you're taking an average over n returns, so n lookaheads, and uh, you're weighting them by some parameter lambda. And that's, uh, again, averages make things stabler and uh, reduce variance, and that's an average over an expectation uh, that, you, that you have uh, taken before. So it, it, it's already, it's again, a good idea. So TD lambda learning replaces what we had before, GT up to N by GT lambda. Now, question. Uh, so one of the most well-known TD techniques is called TD zero. And our, how can TD zero be recovered from TD lambda or be shown as a special case of TD lambda? So could it be that, uh, so what is TD0? TD0 is uh, the technique that we showed here. It's the technique where we do a one-step look ahead, right? So why is the technique called TD0 if it's using a one-step look ahead? Why isn't it called TD1? So the reason is because the name comes from the TD lambda framework and it's by setting lambda to zero. So if you set lambda to zero, you get TD1. Ah, lambda to zero, you get TD0, which is one step look ahead. So how does this work? If you set lambda to zero, then what you get in this equation here is one, times a sum over one element, which is n is one, and uh, zero up to the one, uh, zero up to zero, because uh, one minus one is zero, is one, 
So what you get is GT1. Yeah? So GT lambda with lambda equaling, uh, equal, setting, uh, setting lambda equal to zero is GT up to one. <laughs> Again, <wow. laughs> Yes, you see it's complicated. So <laughs> setting lambda to zero gives you GT1. And the whole technique is called TD0. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> So the most uh, well-known technique that comes out of all of these uh, techniques that uh, include uh, Monte Carlo sampling, uh, recursive estimation, and TD learning is Q-learning. And Q-learning uh, basically uh, combines sampling. So we are sampling uh, an action observing uh, rewards and states. And uh, we're doing a TD0 style recursive computation for policy optimization. So this part here is exactly the TD0 uh, estimate of our uh, future return. So we, we, we know everything from the Bellman uh, optimality equations and uh, we know how, uh, what this is here from the TD0 style and we know how sampling works from the Monte Carlo technique. So it's a combination of all three of them. And the technique is quite simple. You initialize a state, you sample an action, and for that action, you are recursively uh, recomputing your state value function by looking at the TD error that com uh, compares the state value that you have at the moment to your estimate of uh, the state value that you get in the future, right? By looking at the immediate reward and the, re the reward that you get by greedily doing uh, an action from uh, and moving to a next state. And this can be shown as uh, by uh, the Bellman optimality equation to converge uh, to the optimal uh, well, okay, so that basically was uh, the whole of Monte Carlo and temporal difference learning. So let's summarize what we have learned about this. So what's the difference between Monte Carlo and, and temporal difference? So why uh, do we need both of them? So Monte Carlo, as I said, has a high variance because if you always learn from full episodes, then you will uh, have a high variance by uh, every new state uh, being uh, a bias for the next possible states and so on and so forth. You will, you, you will basically never see two, uh, two exact same uh, trajectories or uh, sequences. And so you will uh, see a lot of uh, variance in uh, estimating uh, the Markov uh, and estimating your parameters under Markov assumptions where the whole history is, is, is unimportant, but the history is actually important. So what you do is uh, you want to reduce the variance by introducing a little bit of bias by the TT, TD techniques. So what do they do? They reduce the variance by uh, uh, making sure that you only uh, depend on a single action transition and reward in doing what you're doing, right? So the TD target is always, uh, it, it only performs one action and goes in the next state and, and, and gets a reward. And then you already do an update. So you, you, you don't have to wait until you are at the end of the sequence and use this and then uh, do the updates of the parameters. Then the other nice thing is you can use incom incomplete episodes. You, you, so you don't have to be able to sample every episode to the end. And you can do online updates while you are, while you are looking at, uh, at episodes for every state, uh, at every time point, you can do an update already. Of course, you are introducing uh, a little bit of bias in, in, in that you are in, uh, approximating your uh, expected return instead of using the actual return that you would get by sampling to the end. Okay, so if we now summarize over all the techniques that we have seen so far, namely 
the dynamic programming, the Monte Carlo and the TDE techniques, then we can summarize them as so-called uh, techniques that are focused on value functions, right? So all we did is we looked at the value function or the state value function and we were looking to find, for example, for policy optimization, the optimal value function then which allows us to do a greedy action and then get the optimal policy. So value functions are also called critics. So these techniques can be called critic only techniques. And the, the main disadvantage of these techniques is they are indirect. So what if we are interested in learning the policy and we are using a value function, this is an indirect approach of of learning the policy. So it means while we are learning, it's impossible to know how far we have actually gotten towards our optimal policy, because what we are optimizing is we are optimizing our value function. And uh, we only can say at, the, at convergence, our optimal uh, value function lets us uh, gives us an optimal policy. But in between, there is, uh, it, it, it's, it's quite unclear what, what's happening. How, how good does the value function have to be in, in order to optimize the policy? Where are we in our value optimization in terms of policy optimization? So uh, that's uh, what we will look at next, mainly uh, by looking at policy gradient techniques which are direct methods and uh, but before let's take a break by having uh, a question answer session. Okay, uh, so we had already a few questions on the Q&A that I answered uh, in written form. And I'm just, uh, so if you have questions that you want to, to ask, please uh, yeah, do it by chat or ask directly. I will just answer or, or uh, repeat the most important one. So one was, the first question was, are all possible states preserved for finding a probability? So that's the key of the MDP, the M in the MDP, the mark of decision process. So the Markov property or the Markov assumption means that you only keep the state immediately before and that makes the whole process efficient. If you would keep an infinite number or a large number of states in your history, you wouldn't get anywhere. So this question came, uh, came about uh, several times. Then there were some questions on what are the constraints? Uh, well, there is only one little constrained on the discount, discounted return that should be decreasing and everything else is pure uh, Monte Carlo techniques uh, so far, probability theory, dynamic program techniques, it's, there's nothing, nothing, nothing new behind these techniques. You, you might have heard uh, similar techniques in the lectures on parsing and sequence to sequence learning, this dynamic programming is just, it's another application of dynamic programming to these MDPs and not to uh, parses or other graphs. So we have a new chat. Okay. Why is it problematic to focus on deterministic instead of stochastic policies? Um, so uh, stochastic policies, um, that's, that's the most natural. So we want to apply everything to, uh, to NLP. And in NLP, our, uh, our actions, we have many actions, right? We have exponentially many actions. So it, 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 it always makes sense to have a probability distribution over the actions. This is what stochastic policies do for you. Deterministic policies are, is something that are, where you basically just say on off, do I, do I perform this action or don't I perform this action? That's, uh, 
that's not really what we want. We, we want to choose out of many, many actions, the one that fits best to our history of states by just getting a reward on how good we will do in the future by performing this action in this particular state. So it's, uh, it's really, we want to, we, the same problem as we always have in NLP. We have a large, large uh, uh, set of, of actions or possibilities or, or sequences, next tokens, uh, next things we can do in, 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 in the context. And uh, we really need, uh, ideally we would have supervised uh, information, then we could just uh, inform ourselves about uh, what to do next by looking at or uh, giving examples of what has been done in the past in this context, but now we, we don't have that. So we just do a trial and error we do our next action and uh, based on the feedback, we look ahead in the future and uh, make the right decision. So stochastic policies is, is the thing to do. So maybe uh, all of these things, uh, the, the questions, since you, you all are uh, NLPers, I, I think, right? This is the... Uh, that's the focus of the of the machine learning school, right? It's mostly NLP applications. And uh, so the next part of the lecture, the policy gradient techniques, those are the techniques that we will actually use when we move on to natural language processing applications. And they are much, much easier to understand than what you have seen before. It's not that they are easier or less complicated, but it's they are well known. It's just an application of standard gradient-based techniques to a new uh, objective function, which is the reinforcement learning, the expected reward objective. What you have seen so far, this is really, this is the history that you have to know. And some people still use this value-based technique. So that's uh, why uh, it's, it's good to know uh, what they do. But uh, I would say those techniques are not the best choice for uh, moving into uh, large action spaces and uh, complicated uh, reinforcement learning problems. So maybe at this point we should just, uh, I see I have three more open questions. What happens if the reward is not given immediately? Um, so what you have to do then is uh, if you have one reward for a whole sequence, it's called reward shaping. So what you do is uh, you, you basically break down the reward into, into small pieces so that you can attribute uh, mostly what is done uh, uh, a similar amount of reward to all the actions that you have seen in your whole sequence. So if you get it in the end, then you just uh, prorate it by, by the actions you have taken and you say each action contributed an equal amount to this reward that I got in the end. Then there is another question. How do we sign an environment on NLP task? This is what you will see in, 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 in the rest of the lecture. We, we will talk about machine translation and you will see exactly what an MDP uh, representation of uh, machine translation looks like. Yeah, so the, uh, the states are, are your history in machine translation. Whatever you have in the source and whatever you have uh, predicted so far, that's your states. Okay, so since the lecture is, uh, there's still a lot of uh, stuff to cover. I would say, uh, Fernando, if you agree, we should continue. And in 50 minutes, we have the next okay. Q&A session. Yeah, I agree. Let's get back like 10, 15, maybe, or a little more okay. if you want. 10, 15, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. see you in a while. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, I'm back. So before uh, the question and answer break, we discuss critic only techniques or value only techniques. Now we look at uh, techniques that uh, optimize the actor directly or optimize actor and critic together. These are called policy gradient techniques. So what, what's interesting about them is that they directly optimize the expected return by optimizing the parameters of a parameterized stochastic policy. So that's the goal for uh, policy optimization. You want to find the policy that, optim uh, that gives you the optimal expected reward. So the techniques that we will look at first are actor only techniques where we only look at parametric policies and then we'll, uh, in the end we will look at extra critic techniques where you have a parametric policy and a parametric form of your value function. So what's the, uh, the main idea behind policy gradient techniques? So we will look at them uh, from the perspective of simplified one-step Markov decision processes or so-called gradient bandits. So the idea here is we are not looking at a sequence of states and actions, but we're looking at uh, an action that produces a whole sequence at once. So we're basically looking at one action only. Uh, and uh, this is a simpler uh, case where we have an, an output our action, why, and uh, a reward for the quality or of this output. So an example would be uh, the whole uh, sequence of action of a robot is uh, your output, or a whole translation, a whole sentence is your output, or any other uh, whole sequence. The objective is you want to find the policy parameters that are uh, optimize the reward for all the actions that you can produce. So the idea uh, to compute the gradient for uh, this form is uh, you want to have a gradient that can use uh, standard uh, techniques for optimization like gradient and expectations because the expectations are you need uh, to do sampling. So how can you how can you get a gradient for this uh, for this form here, uh, if for example the delta function is non-differentiable? So what we do is we use the so-called uh, log derivative trick that we will see down here, which is just we are replacing the derivative of the log probability by the derivative of the probability divided by one over p. So let's go through it step by step. The derivative of an expectation, this is just a definition, can be uh, rewritten as uh, the sum of the derivative. And now we are introducing the factor of one, which is P divided by P, in order to rewrite the derivative of P as the deriv derivative of log P by pulling this one over P in here. And what we have in the end is we have a nice expectation form. So we have the expectation over uh, the, the outputs produced by the policy and uh, we are computing delta, our reward, and the derivative of the log probability. And this is called the score function. So the whole uh, idea is called the score function gradient estimator and uh, it works by sampling an output and doing an update by evaluating this very output and computing the score function for the output. And we do that by stochastic gradient descent. That means for every output, we make an update. And uh, in expectation, uh, doing the stochastic updates, we will get an update for the, for the full expectation. So we have an unbiased estimator. So why is this thing called this core function estimator? Because uh, what we are doing, if you look at the update here, we are moving in the direction of uh, this core function and pushing up the score of the sample in uh, proportion to its reward. 
So that's, uh, we are basically scoring the produced action and, and, and moving up uh, the derivative or going more in the direction of, uh, of actions that have a high reward. So, and this is also how you can understand the term reinforcement learning. High reward examples are weighted higher in this procedure. So they are reinforced. So the derivative of, uh, of high reward samples are reinforced. And uh, the nice thing about this estimator is it allows you to use expectations and you can apply it even if uh, the delta function is not differentiable. If the delta function is differentiable, you would get a different gradient. You would use the, uh, the chain rule of probabilities. But if it's not, then uh, what do you do? This is one solution to do it. This is the, the most standard technique of optimizing uh, policies directly, the score function gradient estimator. So how can we now use this for MDPs? For MDPs, we have a, a sequence of state action pairs. Uh, so we have episodes and uh, not single actions, but still the objective that we are looking at is the expectation of the reward for this full uh, whole sequence and the gradient since we have the Markov property. Uh, we can apply the same idea of gradient and we are just here. What we have is we have the derivative of the log probability, which gives us the sum of the derivative of the log probabilities, right? So if we have independent state, uh, state action, uh, a, a sequence of uh, states and actions where they are all independent of each other because of the Markov property, then we have a product of them take the log of the product and, the, uh, and, and, and we get a sum of the derivatives of the log probabilities. So that's how we can easily uh, use the idea that we, that we applied here to the uh, one-step MDPs to the standard multi-step MDPs. And the reinforcement gradient ascent technique looks uh, like this. We sample an episode obtain the reward for the whole episode and then do an update after we have looked at this at the full episode by going with a learning rate of alpha in the direction of, uh, of the highly rewarded uh, episodes and uh, scoring them by the score function, which is the sum of the derivatives of the log probabilities of all of the actions in our sequence. So the general form of this uh, policy gradient algorithm is uh, given as follows. We have uh, an action value function and our objective is the expected reward or the expected uh, action value for all state action pairs and the gradient as before, because we, we have this independence of our state action pairs from the history, is the derivative of the log probability times uh, the factor that is now not the immediate reward, but uh, the state action value. And the policy gradient ascent is uh, again the same. We sample an episode at each time step, we get a reward and uh, we incrementally update our parameters by summing, summing up the contributions for each uh, state action pair uh, where we, with a learning rate alpha, we uh, have a weight that is, that is given by uh, the action value function and a score function, which is the derivative of the log probability. Okay. So uh, this policy gradient uh, algorithm, so they have been formalized with respect to the state value function in, uh, in a paper by Sutton in 2000. And uh, they have earlier, so 10 years earlier, the very same algorithm has been invented by uh, Williams and he called the algorithm reinforce. And uh, he did not use uh, the state action value function, uh, but he used the immediate uh, discounted, the actual discounted returns in his algorithm. And that algorithm is called, is known as the reinforce algorithm. 
It's basically a policy gradient idea with the score function gradient estimator, but the state value function that is used in the paper from 2000 is replaced by the immediate uh, or by the actual discounted return. So what are the problems of uh, re the reinforce algorithm and in general the policy gradient algorithm? So again, we have large variance if all we do is we wait for the whole episode to, 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 to finish and learn from our whole episodes because every episode, if they are long, will be different from, from the other. So if we will move in one direction in of when, they, when we compute the gradient for one learning from one episode, for the next one, we go in a totally different direction and so on and so forth. So we want to make sure that this variance is reduced because it makes the estimate unstable and it, and it takes long to converge. So each gradient update in, uh, in, in, in these algorithms is independent of the past gradient updates. So we want to make sure that this is not the case. So one of, uh, one of the simplest techniques to uh, make sure that uh, variance is reduced is uh, using baselines. And this was already invented in 1992 by Williams in his reinforce algorithm. And uh, the, the baseline that he, uh, that he uh, introduced is the baseline by average returns because he was using uh, immediate returns and one of the baselines that is, uh, is very useful and was used by him is the average return baseline. So what is a baseline? So the standard update of uh, the reinforce algorithm is the immediate return times the score function. Now we are introducing a baseline which basically uh, compares our immediate return to some average, some baseline, some expectation. So the, uh, the, the intuitive uh, use of, of, of a baseline is if you have uh, a very high uh, return for, for, for a particular action, then this will be higher than your expectation, than your average. If you have a very small return, it will be lower than your, uh, than your baseline. So you're basically introducing something like positive and negative rewards. You're going in the direction of the, of the, of the gradient if, if it's higher than the baseline and you're going away in the opposite direction if uh, your reward is lower than the baseline. And as can be shown uh, formally, this is also a variance reduction uh, technique. So how is it a variance reduction technique? So this is, uh, if you look at this as a control variant. So a control variant is, uh, you have a random variable X. In our case, this is the stochastic gradient. And uh, you are looking at a highly correlated variable to your uh, random variable X. And if you subtract this highly correlated variable from your uh, uh, variable x, then you can sh show that the variance of x minus y is uh, reduced if they have a co high covariance. So what you do is you look for a, a highly correlated variable and subtract it and you will reduce the variance. And uh, this is an unbiased gradient estimator because the expectation of X minus Y plus the expectation of Y gives you the expectation of X, which is the definition of unbiasedness. So how do you find an un uh, a highly correlated variable that you can uh, subtract? So one of the simplest ideas is to use a constant and an average is a constant. And uh, the simplest idea is uh, use uh, an average as baseline and then what you will get is the expectation of your baseline is actually zero. So what, it, what that means is that you, you, you get an, uh, an, an unbiased estimator and uh, you don't have to reintroduce uh, the expectation of Y. So what you, all you have to do is the expect, uh, you have to subtract uh, y, and the since you know the expectation of y is zero, you can ignore it. Yeah, so it's a very simple addition to your algorithm. 
so how can we show that the expectation of uh, a constant baseline is zero? That's important to know. Well, this will, uh, if, you, if you do this exercise uh, at, at home, if you, if, if you, if you go through, through all steps, then you, then you will understand this core function gradient estimator. So the proof is uh, if our, uh, our uh, function y, our random, our random variable y that we use as a baseline is uh, what we uh, said here, namely, B times derivative of log P, right? So there's this core function times B. Now we, what we want to show is that the expectation of, the expectation of this is zero. So by definition, what we have here, we are just replacing derivative of log P by uh, derivative of P divided by P times P. Then since B of S, which is defined for a state, is uh, the average of the rewards for a state is constant with respect to the expectation over actions. We can pull it out. And then what we have here is we have the derivative of the sum over all actions for the probability of an action, which is one. And the derivative of a constant is zero. And zero times B is zero. So what we get is there are the expectation of a constant baseline is zero, leading us to a very simple algorithm where all we have to do is subtract this uh, baseline. And we have an unbiased estimator that reduces the variance. Nice and good. Okay, then uh, an even uh, more advanced technique to reduce variance is uh, not just use a baseline, but use uh, a learned baseline. So this is basically what extracritic methods do. So they approximate the critic, which is the, uh, the value function by, uh, by a function. They are not taking uh, a baseline function that is an average over immediate rewards, but they are, they are learning uh, this expectation. Okay. So what is, uh, uh, what is uh, the, the standard actor critic? And uh, we'll look at standard actor critic and so-called advantage actor critic. So the standard actor critic, what it does is it replaces uh, uh, our uh, value function by a TD uh, update for a linear approximation of the value function. And the policy gradient update is then reinforced with respect to this linear approximation of our value function. So how it works is we sample an action for each time step, we get the reward, transition, and uh, the next action. And what we do is we compute uh, the TD error which is the difference between the reward and the uh, discounted uh, state value to the current state value for our estimate of our state value function. Then the update of the uh, policy parameters is the standard uh, reinforce update. So we are, we are looking at this is now our reward times the score function, the relative of log probability. And the update of the, of the critic parameters is, it's, uh, this is just what comes out of minimizing the mean squared error between the current estimate and the expected estimate. And the mean squared error means this here is D, also delta, delta times the inner derivative. And the inner derivative of uh, a linear function is just uh, the weight, other the, uh, the feature vector, so this uh, vector phi here. So what we do is in, uh, in, in, in contrast to a standard reinforcement learning algorithm, we are replacing uh, the immediate uh, return in reinforced by a learned function of the return. And uh, in addition, we are also doing a TD update for this linear approximation. This is done here. So the delta updates our TD error and 
then we are also updating the parameters of our critic function. And we're using this critic function as our weight in the policy parameter updates. And what's nice about this, our extra critic algorithm in contrast to the algorithms that we have seen before is also that we are doing true online updates, right? So the updates that we are doing here of all parameters are done after every step. So we are sampling action for a given for a given state and reward, and we, we, we are not uh, we are not waiting for the whole episode on or are we are not incrementally summing up the contributions uh, for all state action pairs for the episode and then doing an update. We are doing it right now, right right away while we are learning, and this makes sense because then. Uh, our critic uh, approximation will be updated and more stable and uh, the policy will be more stable. Okay, so what I said before, we can use this idea of extra critic to uh, estimate not only our reward, but we can estimate also our baseline and the reward and this is called advantage extra critic. So advantage means uh, we are looking at uh, the advantage of performing a particular action over uh, the value function. So what, what, what advantage are we getting by performing a, a particular action uh, compared to all other actions, right? So we are comparing the action value function to the state value function, which is the expectation over all actions. And we, in, instead of using uh, the simple uh, critic function that uh, tells us uh, something about values, we are using the advantage function as our, uh, as our weighting function. So the, the, the whole algorithm will look like uh, we are doing an update of our extra parameters by looking at the score function and computing the difference between the estimated state value function and the value function. And the value function here can be seen as a stand-in for our baseline. It's a learned baseline. And uh, again, as we did before in, 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 the, in the extra critic, we define a TD error and update the delta and we update the parameters of our critic function by minimizing the mean squared error between the state value function and the value function. So the, the difference between the advantage actor critic in its base form and the actor critic in its base form is that we are uh, in addition to, uh, a learn, uh, to a, a learned function for the value, we have a learned function for the average value for the baseline. Yeah, and this can all be done in one, in one step, in one go. Okay, so to summarize the policy gradient techniques is uh, the nice property of the policy gradient techniques is they can uh, build up on huge knowledge that we have in stochastic optimization and we have a, a good theoretical uh, understanding about convergence properties of stochastic optimization. We can just apply them to this uh, non-convex uh, function of uh, expected rewards. Then the gradient-based uh, techniques are model-free. We don't have to know the MDP transition matrix of, uh, of states and, and, the, and rewards in full because we can use sampling. That's one of the ingredients of the policy gradient techniques of the reinforce idea, right? So we are, we are computing a gradient in a way that we can do sampling. And the problem of high variance can be reduced by, on the one side, estimating the actor, and on the other side, estimating the critic and reducing the variance by uh, fine-tuning the updates of the, of, the, of the actor and the critic and uh, minimizing the TD error and doing all of this step-by-step step while online learning and, and, and not waiting for full episodes to be uh, rolled out we will uh, get better estimates with lower variance. All right. So this was the uh, setup for policy gradient techniques as uh, you will find it in any textbook. And uh, let's uh, step back and uh, 
digest what we have seen so far what is what is the textbook knowledge that i that i told you about so i told you about the difference between policy evaluation and policy optimization and uh, then we immediately stepped to the interesting problem of policy optimization and we showed that different techniques for policy optimization can be reused from the policy evaluation like dynamic programming, Monte Carlo, or both, TD learning, and uh, the old techniques or the tabular techniques require full knowledge of, uh, of the MDP uh, environment. And uh, thus, they are only applicable to uh, small scale scenarios. Policy gradient techniques have advantages in, the, in that they directly optimize our objective of interest and the use sampling and the reduce variance. So they will be uh, the, the favorite techniques for large scale applications where you have long sequences that you have to learn from. So this is where we will, uh, what we will look at next. So we will look at a uh, simple uh, or first uh, applications of reinforcement learning to sequence to sequence learning and what we look at first is sequence to sequence reinforcement learning from simulated feedback and then we will look at our uh, improvements of reinforcement learning from simulated feedback to finally going to working with real human feedback what do we have to do that so but first let's look at reinforcement learning from simulated feedback so sequence to sequence learning, everybody knows what, uh, what's it all about. We have an input sequence. We have an output sequence. One is uh, in the, uh, denoted by X, the other one by Y. And uh, the sequence to sequence learner uh, produces uh, token by token given the input sequence and the history produced so far. And uh, the objective in, uh, in optimization is uh, we want to maximize the likelihood of uh, parallel data. So now we are looking at neural machine translation. The inputs are uh, sentences in one language. The outputs are translations in another language. So we want to optimize the log probability of our data set. How do we do that? Um, we uh, define the probability of uh, the output sentences given the input sentences step by step by looking at uh, the token wise uh, uh, predictions and uh, we are uh, formalizing uh, the model p theta as a neural network that uses a softmax normalized output vector over the vocabulary size to decide which of the outputs at the current uh, time step t is uh, the best one. And there are several uh, uh, ways of defining this neural network and uh, we will not go into any details here. So the, the first uh, networks that have been used for successfully for that task are recurrent neural networks. Then there are also approaches where we use uh, convolution neural networks and the state of the art nowadays is uh, attention only neural networks or mixes of our recurrent and attention only neural networks. Okay, so the, the main question that uh, one has to ask is if neural machine translation works so nicely by optimizing the likelihood of the data, why ever do we want to use our reinforcement learning and not just stick to the parallel data? Well, there might be several uh, scenarios where it makes sense to do this. So one scenario might be human references might not be available for under resourced languages, for example. So you, you might imagine a language pair where you don't have any translations that are done by professionals and where you can train a system. So you, you might uh, have to recur to the scenario where you are getting feedback from the, from the, from the few uh, remaining speakers of the language that tell you if these translations are, are, are good or not. Then another more interesting scenario or more uh, well financially interesting scenario is for uh, commercial NMT services, weak signals 
might be easier to be uh, uh, elicited from, uh, from humans than uh, paying human translators to actually translate a lot of data. So we will see uh, examples for where human feedback can be elicited from, uh, from humans that use online translation services. And uh, I, I promise the time, the time will come where companies will use this feedback. I know that companies are collecting this feedback and as it is at the moment, it's still cheaper for them to pay humans to, uh, to annotate uh, hundreds of thousands of data and that's enough for training. But uh, they will, at, at some point, they will see that there is an even larger source of, of data that can be uh, used with, with no effort, it's, it's there for free, it's, it, it's, it's data that are, uh, that are dynamic, that are coming in uh, on a daily basis. So we will see the time of uh, human reinforcement or signals being used for online services as they are used at the moment for other applications. So for machine translation. So the other, the other point I want to make is, so if you look in the Sutton and Barto book, uh, what they say about the future of artificial intelligence. And the statement is, the full potential of reinforcement learning requires reinforcement learning agents to be embedded in the flow of real world experience, where they act, explore and learn in our world, not just in their worlds. So this is basically, uh, yeah, I would interpret it as reinforcement learning or artificial intelligence progress cannot only be measured by uh, artificial scenarios like gaming. So you have to, you have to if, if you want to claim progress or success of reinforcement learning, then you have to use these agents in real world scenarios. And this will be, this is the next step. Okay. So the idea for using reinforcement learning uh, in, on a large scale, for example, for neural machine translation comes from uh, computational advertising where banded algorithms have been used for a long time, very successfully. And uh, the idea in computational advertising is that uh, you cannot expect any user or, or, or you, you cannot pay anybody to, to annotate the quality of ads that are shown to, to a user. It's, it's, uh, and you also want to use this, this huge body of feedback that uh, people give for free by clicking on ads or not clicking on ads. So the same can be done for applications like uh, machine translation where people click or, uh, on translations or do not click on, on translations. Uh, there are some, there is evidence that uh, companies are collecting this feedback. So let's look at it. So for example, Facebook uh, is translating uh, pages uh, from Spanish and uh, you can uh, rate the translations by clicking on star ratings, saying, I can't understand anything to I can understand everything. So that's basically a, a five, uh, five point Likert scale uh, judgment on the quality of the translation. Then Microsoft uh, allows you to uh, do thumbs up and sub down, thumbs down for a translation, which is also a, a very quick uh, feedback signal that, you, that, that can be collected. Then the Microsoft Translator community allows you to do a pairwise judgment between two translations, which one is better. Or uh, the Google Translator community also does, allows you to give a pairwise judgment and you can even say both are bad or both are good. And even more, you can uh, some uh, Google Translate shows uh, partial translations and if you choose one of them, then it's very clear that you made a choice between the translations that have been shown by selecting one over the others. So this is what I, what I mean by weak feedback or rewards from humans uh, to translation outputs. And now we want to show how can we use this feedback to, to, to learn, to improve, to, to improve machine translation systems. Maybe even uh, 
yeah, for, for, for scenarios where human feedback is easier to get or for, for dynamic scenarios or for, for, for domains where you don't have a large set of manual translations for, for applications where uh, it's uh, feedback from humans is extractable, but our human translations cannot be extracted or, or given very quickly. Okay, so first, the first study we do is a simulation study. Simulation study meaning is uh, that the reward is uh, obtained by evaluating uh, the quality of the generated sequence by some evaluation on actually existing uh, human translations. So the MDP, uh, the NMT setup uh, is that uh, a state is defined as uh, the input and the currently produced tokens. The reward is by uh, just using it in, uh, an evaluation function that compares the translation to an existing reference translation and an action is corresponding to generating the next token. So this is a, this is a very special uh, reinforcement learning setup. So the question is, what is, what is special in this setup uh, con if you compare it to the standard uh, Markov decision process scenario? So something is different. So what's different is that uh, while uh, the probability of uh, producing an action or the tokens can be nicely be formulated as a stochastic policy, the state transition uh, probability matrix is deterministic because once you have produced an action, you immediately know what your next state is. So the next state is the concatenation of the action to the history and this is your next state. So you don't have a probabilistic state transition probability matrix, it's deterministic, but still you can apply the techniques of reinforcement learning to this special kind of uh, MDP. And what's also maybe a little bit uh, unusual is that we take the NMT system to be the agent while the human user is providing the rewards. We are, we are not trying to model a human user. The human user that we have in mind basically is the user of the, of the NMT system or a professional translator that tries to uh, adapt the NMT system to his own needs. That would be a user. But what we mostly have in mind is the, the a user of Google Translate that gives feedback to the system and uh, over, over time, his personalized Google account will give him better translations. Okay, so now how do we use the, uh, the policy gradient uh, idea to, uh, to uh, do parameter optimization. So the expected loss or reward objective is the same as before. We are, child, we are uh, it's, uh, so our loss depending on theta is the expected uh, reward under uh, the policy, which is defined by a neural network, by neural sequence to sequence learning model. So what we, what we want to do is we want to sample outputs and perform stochastic gradient updates concerning uh, policy gradient or using policy gradient. So that's the idea. Neural banded structure prediction is, uh, works by taking an input, sampling a full output, getting the feedback and doing an update by uh, a stochastic gradient that is defined in the very same way as we saw it for the gradient banded before. So why is it called banded structure prediction? Why? It's a gradient banded that the, the banded, the, the banded uh, meaning is that uh, we sample an output and we only get one chance of collecting a reward. For this one output we get our feedback. We are not allowed to sample several translations and average the rewards for them. We only have one chance. This is a very realistic scenario. So Google Translate won't give you 50 different translations and uh, collect feedback and then do another step and produce the best one after updating the parameters. You're producing one translation and 
for this one translation, you get the feedback and you can update your system in the background, but that's it. Yeah, so why neural bandit? Because it's a one state MVP where we all, all we get is bandit feedback. So if you look at uh, the, uh, the book by Bubek and uh, Kesa Bianchi, uh, you will see that uh, the idea or the name bandit comes from uh, one armed uh, bandit machines or bandit slot machines where the idea is that the learner receives feedback to a single prediction. It does not know what the correct prediction is or what would have happened if he had predicted uh, differently. So the most important thing to uh, make these bandit algorithms work because they have, of course, a huge variance. You're producing a full translation and for every single translation, you get one, a one point feedback to the quality of this uh, full translation. And now you have to make sense of it and learn from it, right? So all the, tra the translations might be different. Uh, the rewards might be, uh, it, it's just one real number. You, there, is, there is no good way to, to basically, uh, yeah, know what, where the error is in your translation. What are the good parts, what, the, what are the bad parts? In this scenario, all you have is one sequence and one reward. So you have to make sure that you can learn from this. And what you do is you use the idea of control variates, which has been shown to be very, very useful. So, and the control variates that have been used in the literature is time, which is the average of the rewards, or you use the score function directly as your, uh, as your uh, control variate. And uh, if you look at empirical results, ah, Sorry, there's, a, there's another version of uh, banded neural machine translation that uh, not uses uh, baselines, but uh, uses advantage extracritic techniques where the baselines are learned. So it's the, uh, the same uh, gradient approximation as we have seen before. So it's the uh, score function gradient estimator, but uh, the reward function now is uh, and per action advantage function. So you're, you're getting the reward for every single translation and you're comparing it to the, the estimated value of uh, the, uh, the output that you have produced so far. So the state value function centers the reward. It's basic, it's, it's the same idea as the baseline that we have seen before, but now it's a learned baseline. And uh, the idea of this paper is that they use uh, a learned baseline and uh, learn a separate uh, encoder decoder that uh, trains uh, or, the, or optimizes the parameter of the learned baseline by doing the minimum, minimum squared error of uh, the actual reward and a linear approximation. Okay, let's look at empirical results. So what do we get if in uh, our simulation, we are using the per sentence blue score against the reference? Of course, this is not, uh, this is not uh, a very useful scenario. If we have a reference, why not use the reference? It's, uh, these uh, experiments are only, only good to find out what do we have to do if we had a perfect reward function to, uh, to learn from this. Uh, very sparse one point banded feedback reward uh, for neural machine translation. So how important are baselines, how important are learned baselines and so on. So that's, that, that, that's the purpose of these first experiments. So what we look at is we are looking at a domain adaptation uh, scenario where we train our model on large data from European parliaments and we uh, apply them to uh, news commentary, which is a smaller domain. And uh, the, the, the numbers here mean this is uh, the, the upper bound that we can't really achieve. This is if we train our uh, in-domain model on the available in-domain data by using the references. So then we get six blue points improvement. 
But on the other hand, what we also get is on the out, on the out of domain data, we have a loss of, of five blue points because basically the, uh, the model is uh, forgetting what it learned on the out of domain data by learning, by being fine tuned on the in domain data. So for this scenario, reinforcement learning is, uh, is, is an ideal, uh, an, an, an ideal middle way, uh, an, an ideal trade-off. We see we can get up to four blue points improvement on the in-domain data, but we never lose more than 1.9 on the out-of-domain data. And if we do the same for an application of uh, Europal train models to TET data, so uh, TET data are also a spoken language. It's uh, the TET uh, talks on and uh, here we see uh, training on this in-domain data gives you even 12 points blue improvement and we can, we can get to six points, but instead of losing 8.4, we are only losing two. So we see we get considerable improvements by in-domain uh, reinforcement learning and we are not losing too much on the out-of-domain data. And it's a, it's a pointer that we can actually learn from this weak feedback signal. If the weak feedback signal is available in, in large enough amounts and if it's uh, clean enough. Okay, so if we want to go uh, to the next step to, to our ultimate goal, namely learning from real human feedback. So we have to ask the question to simulate or not to simulate. And uh, so what we have seen for the domain adaptation experiments, we get impressive gains for learning from simulated feedback only, but uh, the looking only at simulated feedback, which most of the work in uh, NLP applications of reinforcement learning is confined to, we won't actually ever learn about the real world scenario. So I'm, I'm, I'm citing Sutton and Barto again, the future of artificial intelligence. A major reason for wanting a reinforcement learning agent to act and learn in the real world is that it's often difficult, sometimes impossible to simulate real world experience with enough fidelity to make the resulting policies work well and safely when directing real actions. So if we want to learn about the real world, we have to learn and perform in the real world. And uh, this is uh, what's up next, from simulations to human RL, and we have uh, another Q&A session. Okay, <clears throat> so I got a lot of uh, questions that I answered in written form. And uh, again, let me tell you about the highlights. Um, so there were a few questions on uh, how to use reinforcement learning to uh, deal with non-differentiable rewards. So that's, uh, I would say, unfortunately, how reinforcement learning nowadays is uh, exclusively used in, in NLP. People have their evaluation metrics and they are mostly non-differentiable. And uh, now they see, ah, I can train policy gradient techniques using these non-differentiable uh, rewards and basically tune my models directly to rouge and bleu and, and other metrics. And, uh, but this is not, this is not what, I'm, what I was actually intending reinforcement learning to be used for. So I, my, my goal always was to use reinforcement learning for real world interaction with humans. And uh, this is a, 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 a really, uh, it, it's a different problem. And in the last, in, in the last uh, series and in the last block of the lecture, you will, you, you will hear about actual uh, interactions of reinforcement learning with, uh, with humans, where you have very noisy rewards and where you, you can't basically rely on distilling a supervision signal from uh, existing supervision signals. So, uh, 
the way, re in my opinion, the way reinforcement learning nowadays is used in NLP, this will change in the next five, 10 years. Uh, now it's, it's just, a, it's an add on to supervised learning. So reinforcement learning by using blue rewards works and it improves supervised learning, but not by much. So it, it's just, it's, it's basically tuning your system to make better use of the rewards, but it wouldn't work if you would not have the supervised learning in addition. If you wouldn't pre-train by the supervised learner, nothing would work. So, so cold start reinforcement learning without any supervision signals, this, this is totally off. This is not uh, what, uh, what can work. So it's, it's, it's basically, we are talking about one or two blur points that we can improve our results over supervised learning. But this is not what I was uh, uh, and my group were, were, were aiming at. We, we were always uh, working together with companies who, who actually did interactive work. And the problem, why not everybody is using reinforcement learning nowadays and not using supervised learning anymore is, well, companies have too much money. It's just too easy for them to spend money on getting supervised signals. And that's a better, better signal. And the trade-off money versus signal strengths is such that uh, it's easier to get a lot of uh, good supervision signals than uh, using reinforcement learning techniques where you need many, many, many more data and the data are noisy and so on and so forth. But this will maybe change. Then another question was on active learning. So active learning is also related. And, uh, but again, active learning, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of supervised learning. Active learning just figures out which of the unsupervised data should be labeled so that in the end I can uh, use my standard supervised learning techniques on these newly labeled data. It's, it's not, it's, it's different. The, the learning techniques are different. The objective is different from a machine learning perspective. Then I just got two more questions. Do we usually calculate the metrics after each generation step or after the whole sequences? Yeah, that depends on uh, what your evaluation metrics uh, looks like. That's uh, related to the question we had before. What if I get the reward only at the end? That would be you calculate a blur score at the end, but there are different, if, if you want to calculate blur score step by step, then you have to do something, right? You can, uh, calculate partial blur scores, or you use different metrics like character F score, which are easier to break down from the full sequence to a part of the sequence. So you can do either way, but ideally you would calculate uh, the reward step-by-step step and not only at the end. Then uh, one uh, anonymous uh, student is asking, uh, is our LNMT using gold standard reference translations for rewards? Yeah, that's unfortunately the only way people do it at the moment. They distill a reward signal from the reference and they use the reference and in addition, this is, it's poor man's reinforcement learning. <laughs> if you have the supervision signals uh, that, that, that are distilling a reward from it doesn't give you very much in addition. The real problem, the really hard problem is working without any supervision signals, just putting the system out there like an advertising system, putting it out there in the world and, and, and from the feedback that you get, learn and improve the system. And for MT, it's, uh, it seems to be, yeah, we are, we are not there yet. The systems are maybe not good enough or they are, it's too easy to get good data by crawling the web. Uh, so it's, it's not really necessary to improve the system in the real world. So you can always do it offline and in a safe setup. Okay, so, so Fernando, that's the only way I'm getting questions, right? By uh, in this question answer. So, so nobody, yeah. there is no, there is no uh, channel where somebody says something and I'm not hearing them. No, people no. can raise their hands if they want to okay. ask questions live. So, but nobody did that. Actually, you had like fifteen questions, which is a yeah, it's a, it's a lot, right? Uh huh. But yeah, people can can raise their hands if they want to talk live. 
Okay. So then that there's a new one. How does the system handle attacks? Um, yeah. I did not uh, think about this problem. I don't actually have a, uh, an answer to that. Of course, if, if you uh, work in real inter interactive scenarios, then people can uh, give you wrong rewards and uh, the online system will, uh, will deteriorate. And that's the reason why companies actually don't want to have an online learning system out there. What, 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 if, you, if, you, if, you, if you talk about real world systems that should be improved by reinforcement learning, it's always talking about offline or off policy reinforcement learning, which means you want to collect the feedback and then in a safe scenario, you want to filter out the bad or malicious feedbacks and then uh, learn from them. If, if you would uh, let your system interact with uh, malicious users online, then of course things could happen. And that's why no, no company will ever do that. Yeah. And in advertising, there is no choice. They, they have to do it. And that there are companies making their living out of uh, spamming uh, the advertising systems of, of, the, of the competitors. So you, you, you can buy, uh, yeah, this, uh, this service that if, if you have a product, then uh, you can tell a company, I want you to spam the advertising systems of, of the other companies so that they, they have to pay a lot and are not getting anything. So nobody's actually buying their product. They just get bad clicks and yeah. <laughs> it's not happening for our NLP applications so far. So let's do a small break. Okay. Mm. What do you say if we start at 11.30? A little more than 50 minutes. Okay, then we have 45 minutes. Okay, so I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have to leave at, uh, at uh, in, in an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So that's, that should work out, yeah? yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. If you put up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. See you yeah. later. Yeah. See you later.
Okay, welcome back. So what we have uh, talked about before is uh, simulated reinforcement learning for sequence to sequence models. So now what we want to see is how can we get away from simulations and how can we do reinforcement learning from human feedback. So I call it human RL. So the question is where do simulations fall short? Um, so our first problem in uh, learning from human feedback is that human feedback always is banded feedback only. So that means what you normally see in applications of reinforcement learning to sequence to sequence models is that people uh, sample a lot of actions and take the average of the rewards for these actions, or not the average of the rewards, but the, the, up, the average of the updates for each of the rewards. So they do a policy gradient update for each of the actions for particular states and the average, and improve uh, uh, the, the, uh, the learning by reducing the variance, but this is something that is not possible for learning from humans. You only have one chance and you get one, one, a one point feedback and you have to learn from it. Then the other problem is that uh, all the techniques that we have seen so far are online or on policy learning techniques. And uh, if you want to uh, apply these techniques for companies, there will be immediate concerns about safety, about losing customers, about stability of your commercial system. So you don't want to uh, have your system update itself in the background from human feedback that could be adversarial feedback. So you want to have control over everything. So you have to move from online learning to something else. And lastly, for humans, even if they are not adversarial, uh, humans, their uh, rewards might be noisy and skewed Every human has a different preference for giving feedbacks and uh, the reward is also, it's not well defined. What is the criterion that uh, you are supposed to give uh, an evaluation on? Is it the adequacy of a translation? Is it the fluency of the translation? Do you actually see the source or do you only see the translation? Can you compare the translation with other translations? So it's, it's not well defined. So you will have to go away from assuming that the reward function is something that is given. So you will have to learn reward functions. So uh, even if there have been nice papers that show that uh, you can achieve superhuman performance even for games like uh, playing Atari games or even for, for the game of Go, uh, real world Superhuman performance is not likely to be expected soon for uh, learning sequence to sequence models for machine translation or other applications uh, very soon because of all these problems of learning from uh, human feedback that is noisy and not well defined like winning or losing a game and so on. All right. <clears throat> so how do we address these problems? So the human bandit feedback problem, we also, uh, we already addressed by looking at control variates. So that's basically all we can do, or one of the things we can do is, and that's what we learned from simulations. If we only have one chance and we have a high variance by getting only one chance to do our gradient update and we can't average, we have to reduce the variance by other means. 
by exocritic techniques, by uh, control variates, this is, the, this is the solution that is used so far. For uh, so solving the problem of uh, not being able to do on policy learning because of safety and stability concerns, what we have to do is we have to look at off policy or offline learning techniques. And then lastly, we will look at reward estimation uh, to make sure that the uh, noise and uh, skewedness of the human rewards can be uh, can be caught by a good re uh, reward function, a good, uh, a well estimated reward function. Okay, but let's start with uh, offline learning or off policy learning from uh, log feedback. So the standard is online or on policy reinforcement learning, which means that uh, you are the policy that uh, you are using to sample your trajectories is the policy that you are updating. Yeah, this is why it's called on policy. And ideally you do the updates online. So while you are using this policy to sampling your actions, you are doing updates. So that's, that's what we saw in the actor critic techniques. So, but this is undesirable if our stability or safety is a concern. So online updates is uh, you want to control it. That's not good. And on policy uh, reinforcement learning would mean that it's always the same, that uh, you are not able to update the policy under in a controlled condition and then reuse it. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to go to off policy reinforcement learning, meaning that the policy that is producing your actions is another policy than the policy that you are updating. And you need to do this updating in an offline fashion. So the scenario we're looking at is learning from logged banded feedback. So logs means it's the same name as uh, user logs or uh, action logs when you, when you use an online service. And uh, what you want to do is you want to use uh, the feedback that uh, humans give, what we have seen before, for example, in the, in, in the Google or Facebook or uh, Microsoft translation APIs. Uh, we want to use this logged feedback to update our system, but in a way that uh, the system that is updated is not the same as the system that proposed uh, the translations. And so we have to deal with uh, problems of uh, a mismatch of the policy that we are updating and the policy that we are using now to produce the data, which is called counterfactual learning. So counterfactual learning is uh, estim as a, uh, deals with the question of how would the new system, so the new, the new system is the one that we want to update, how would it have performed if it had been in control of choosing the logged predictions? So we basically have to, have, to, have to answer the question, what are the optimal parameters of the new system if the new system would uh, had produced the predictions for which we are, uh, are logging the feedback. But it, it, it's counterfactual because it actually was not the new system that produced uh, the predictions. So we have to uh, solve this uh, mismatch problem. So what's, uh, what's being done uh, standardly is uh, one uh, is using inverse propensity scoring to learn uh, the new system, the target policy. So the data that you, that you are using in inverse prop uh, propensity scoring is data logs where you have the inputs, the outputs and the rewards for the output. So that's your data log. And you have a logging system, which we uh, denote by mu of y given x. And uh, you have uh, your target policy, which is uh, p theta, yeah? So what we want to uh, now do is we want to uh, maximize the likelihood of uh, this particular uh, function here. It's uh, the, uh, the empirical estimate of the rewards for a normalized or importance or normalized uh, target policy. So rho theta is 
our uh, target policy divided by the logging system probability. So uh, the, the whole scenario is called propensity scoring because the score that you get from your logging system is called the propensity of the logging system. So how likely is a particular output under the logging system? And now you have to make sure that if when you're learning the target policy that you are de-biasing uh, your, uh, your estimates. And de-biasing is done by importance sampling. So the, the idea is quite simple. Uh, you are just dividing or, or prorating the probability of your outputs under the new model by the probability under the sampling policy. So the idea is uh, outputs that have been very likely under the, uh, under the logging policy, they are, they are now a little bit, uh, they are taking, uh, they are prorated, they are, they are normalized, so they are not taken as, uh, as, uh, as, as important in, uh, in, 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 in your data. So if they are, have been very likely to be produced by the logging system, then they are downgraded a little bit. And the ones that are very infrequent because the logging policy didn't like them, they are upweighted. So you want to see them, you want to take them more seriously and, and, and learn from them. So, and, and why does this make sense? Is this, uh, is this an unbiased estimator? Yes, it is. How can you show this? So it's, uh, the idea is uh, quite simple. So if we look at uh, this equation here, we just rewrite it by uh, writing rho as p divided by mu, right? This is what we have here. Then we can see that this formula here is actually uh, an expectation, yeah? Under mu, yeah? Mu is a probability and we are, we are looking at uh, the, the expectation of the random variable R under mu because all the data have been produced by our uh, sampling or, 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 or the logging system mu. So what we see here is it's an average over the samples produced by the logging system. So it's, it, it, it corresponds to the expectation under the logging system. And if we now divide uh, the probability of our new, of our target policy by this very same probability mu, it cancels and what we get is an expectation under pi, which is what we want. We want to have an unbiased estimator of the expectation of R under the new target policy. And we get that by producing the sample according to our uh, logging, logging system mu, and then we are dividing by the probability of mu. Yeah? This is called important sampling. So we are, we are getting an unbiased estimator by sampling from mu and prorating the, the samples by mu again. Okay, this is all nice and good, and uh, this is well known, and uh, unfortunately, it's not applicable to our case of machine translation or natural language processing in general if you use commercial systems. So why is that? Commercial systems use, uh, if they use logging, they use deterministic logging. So what it means, deterministic logging is they show one translation and they get feedback for this one translation, this is logged. So that means we don't know anything about the logging policy new. We don't know how probable this translation was. We have to assume its uh, probability is one, yeah? So it's an exploration-free deterministic logging. And uh, there is theoretical work that shows that under deterministic logging, that it's impossible to learn because you, you have a very, very strong bias to these uh, deterministic logs. But on the other hand, there is other work that shows that uh, some of the techniques that are, have been introduced to reduce variance also reduce bias, and they can be used to do both. 
debiasing and reducing variants and you still can learn. And we will show or see experimental results where we can actually learn from deterministic logs. So the problem, as, we, uh, as I just said, there is no correction in the sampling bias since we don't know mu or we have to assume it's, uh, it's one. And uh, the problem is if you don't correct the sampling bias, it's an even more severe problem as uh, having this bias. The learner that learns from uh, log data can uh, show a degenerate behavior in that uh, the probability of the data is maximized by setting the probability of all log data to one. So that means you're, you're not giving more weight to the, to the to the data that get a high reward and you're not downweighting the data or taking them less seriously if they get a low reward. But if you just say all log data, I want to set the probability of them to one, you are still maximizing the data probability. This is a, a behavior that you want to avoid. And uh, we will show techniques that avoid this problem and also uh, help you to get uh, around the bias problem. Okay, so one of the, pro uh, one of the solutions to get around the bias is, uh, it's, not, it's not actually a technique, it's something that is implicit in uh, sequence to sequence learning, namely or especially in sequence to sequence learning for, uh, for transformation problems, uh, is uh, the input are uh, varying over uh, the sequence of learning. So for every input, you get a new output. And uh, you, you're implicitly exploring the output space by looking at different inputs. So it, it's not the same input that you, are, that you are producing outputs for. It's every input has a different, uh, has diff every source uh, sentence has different translations. Some translations, of course, they must appear more than once, otherwise you can't learn anything about them, but there's enough variation implicitly in the input. And uh, Bastani et al. have shown that, uh, have formalized this and have shown that if you have enough input exploration, you can actually learn. You can get around the problem that has been described as an impossibility result for exploration free of policy learning by Langford and uh, Strehl. Okay, so, but our solution is a different one. Our solution is uh, what we call deterministic propensity matching. So to make, uh, to make clear that uh, we are no longer doing uh, inverse propensity matching, but we are dealing with a deterministic logging situation. And uh, the solution is uh, it, it's, uh, also, it's not very complicated. What we do is we use uh, what's called a multiplicative control variant that has been introduced to reduce variance. And uh, we see that this multiplicative control variant also reduces the bias. So the multiplicative control variant, what it does is, so we are placed, re replacing P by P divided by the sum of the probabilities for all uh, of our, uh, for all the data. So basically for the, for, for, for the whole data set, yeah? And uh, another trick is we are, we are using the probability, not the same probability here, but uh, the probability from the step before in order for the gradient-based estimation to decouple the parameters theta and theta prime to have an easier form of the gradient estimate. Otherwise, you would have to have, uh, you would have a dependency here and uh, the, uh, the, the gradient is, is more complicated. If you just say, this is uh, the probability from one step before, then uh, you get an, uh, an, a nicer and simpler gradient estimate. So the effect of this self-normalized uh, control variant or multiplicative control variant is uh, that not only does it reduce variance, so we, we can, we can uh, get a, a similar formula to the formula that we saw for the additive control variant. So if you compute uh, the variance for this whole term, then we see that it's reduced. If we, if we, if we divide by this term here and uh, but it's also uh, decreasing the bias. 
So the larger B gets, so la the larger this normalization uh, term, also the more samples we look at in these normaliza uh, normalization terms, the, the less bias we will have in our estimate. And uh, intuitively what, uh, what's going on here is, if the problem is that uh, you can get a maximum likelihood estimate by just uh, saying every data point that I have seen, regardless of its reward, has to have probability one. Then if you do a normalization over the whole data set, then uh, you are avoiding that probability mass is, is, is shifted to low reward uh, data by, by, uh, by normalizing through this. So you want, you, you want to make sure that this normalization constant only, uh, only looks at the high reward uh, data points and not at all data points. Otherwise you are taking away probability mass from the higher reward outputs. So this uh, in effect prevents uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, behavior that you, that you actually want to avoid. It, it has been introduced as a variance reducer, but it also is a, bar, a, a bias reducer, something that's, yeah, best of both worlds. How can that be possible? Well, it works uh, experimentally. We see that it works. Okay, so if we do offline learning now under deterministic logging, the gradients that we would get for our uh, ingress propensity scoring would look like this where we have this rho function, which is the, uh, the intensity, uh, importance sampling, uh, normalized probability. And here it's not important sampling. We are not dividing by the logging probability, but we are dividing by the probability of the whole sample. But it's the very same form. It's uh, as easy to implement. It's uh, easy to understand. Okay, so now let's look at some experimental results for real data and let's see how this uh, deterministic propensity scoring works and uh, if, what about other techniques that uh, can be applied and yeah, so what is the problem? The problem that we are looking at now is, so this is uh, an example for uh, an e-commerce uh, translation. So the translation is for the title only and uh, it says game nerd computer geek beach towel yeah and you can rate this translation on a five star scale so we did experiments where we had uh, around seventy thousand item item titles translated from english to spanish and 150,000 ratings and ratings meaning ratings by users who actually looked at these e-commerce sites. And uh, what we found, unfortunately, when we calculate agreement between raters, there was no agreement by in, in, in the original ratings. We then we paid raters to re replicate the ratings. We didn't find any agreement between the paid raters. We even found low inter and intra rater agreement and we basically had to conclude learning is impossible from these data. It's learning from noise. And from noise, you, yeah, you can't learn. So what were our lessons? Um, learning from noise because uh, we are missing reliability and validity of the human feedback. So what does that mean? Reliability means the raters don't agree with themselves and with, with each other. And validity means that the raters actually don't know what they are doing when they are giving the ratings. So the instructions for the ratings for this, uh, for this site were very, um, very unclear. And even if you, if, if you look at the site, it, it's very cluttered, right? Uh, it, it's very hard to understand that what you are doing here is actually only rating the translation of this title here. You are not supposed to look at the price. It, it doesn't matter what the product is. It doesn't matter in which location this product is sold, but this is, this is all going into these ratings, right? If the price is right, then the translation must be right. Otherwise I wouldn't look at it. Uh, on, and 
So is the translation a translation only of the title or the whole page? So it's 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 very unclear. So it's that's that's what I mean by it's 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 unclear that the raters know what they do. It's, it's unclear if the validity is uh, is given. So what we what we did next is we did an experiment where we controlled the feedback collection. So where we where we made sure that uh, it's very clear what the raters do. They get very clear instructions. Uh, we uh, we have a small set of raters. We we, we try out different variants of uh, electing selecting feedback from raters, and uh, then we want to know which kind of feedback uh, works better for learning. And is it true that more reliable feedbacks works better for learning? So is it is it actually true that uh, the noise is the is the reason for not being able to learn from this? So can we control the noise by getting reliable feedback and then can we learn better? Okay, so our, uh, the, the rating interface looks like this. So um, <clears throat> here on, the, on, 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 on this side, you see uh, a five point scale where you only see one translation and the original and you're supposed to say how good the translation is. And here, what you see is two translations and uh, what you have to do is you have to say which one is better or do, don't I have a preference. So five point Likert scale versus pairwise preferences. So uh, there have been a lot of papers written uh, that uh, claim that uh, one type of feedback is better than the other and uh, that it's basically without any experiment it's clear that uh, more reliable feedback leads to uh, to better results in learning so this is basically um yeah common sense statements right so we wanted to verify these common sense statements and we were actually quite surprised so what we did, the first study is the reliability study. So what is better in terms of reliability, five point or pairwise feedback? And then what we call learnability is once we get this data and train reward estimators, are the reward estimators stand alone better than the other? And if we plug in the reward estimators into end-to-end -end reinforcement learning, where do we get better results? So what's your guess? if we uh, look at the, at the whole pipeline. If we uh, select feedback from five point where you only see one translation, is this more reliable feedback that leads to better learning or is uh, the pairwise feedback the way to go? All you have to do is look at two translations and say this one is better than the other. Where will you get more reliable feedback points. Well, we will see. So this is the table with uh, Klippendorf's alpha agreements for interator and intrarator. And uh, what we see is um, if we do uh, a, f a filtering of, uh, of the ratings and filtering means that uh, we are discarding weird raters for uh, five point feedback and uh, we are filtering out very different or very complicated translations for the pairwise feedback. Then the best result that we can get, so we tried out all possible options is we get to 0.5 agreement for uh, interrater agreement for five point and only to 0.39 for pairwise. So the, the, the common sense uh, idea that pairwise rating is always easier because you only have to compare one with the other and it's a, it's a clear-cut judgment, whereas on a five-point scale you never know what is, uh, what is good and what is bad. Uh, all translations are either good or either bad depending on the system and so on. We clearly saw five-point feedback is the way to go. Okay.
So we also did a qualitative analysis by asking the raters about the difficulty and uh, that's our explanation why the ratings for the, for the pairwise were so difficult because many of them said the distinction between very similar translations was very hard. So there might be two very good translations or two very bad translations and how do you, how do you decide? One rater says this way, the other says uh, I'm, I'm going the other way. Then uh, what the other advantage of five point versus pairwise is for, for five point, if raters are skewed, so if one rater always likes to be very lenient and gives very good scores and the other one is very pessimistic and gives very low scores, you can always uh, bring them on the same scale by for each rater, uh, subtract the mean, divide by the variance, and 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 uh, basically center them to their to their average, and and then they will uh, be comparable. So this bias uh, can be can be filtered out, and this is not possible for pairs ratings. It, it's it's a binary judgment. Okay. Okay. So this was a learnability, uh, reliability. Now learnability means. If we now have this data, how do we learn from them? So let's learn reward estimators. The first uh, reward estimator uh, or our main reward estimator is our, our mean squared error estimate where we uh, take the rewards and compare them to uh, uh, the predicted rewards and uh, minimize the mean squared error for an architecture uh, that is uh, based on a sentence, a convolutional network for sentence classification. Now we, we just uh, extended this from uh, a source uh, site only to a source and target uh, model where we do, do convolutions over source target pairs. And uh, the objective functions that we are uh, optimizing is uh, once it's uh, the mean squared error, as I said, for the five per, for the five point ratings, uh, and for the pairwise feedback, we are doing uh, a Bradley Terry model, and the Bradley Terry model is minimizing the cross entropy between predictions and human preferences. So basically, you want to have this term here high, so they have to agree. The human preferences and uh, the predicted preferences have to agree. And uh, the Bradley Terry model works by taking this formula here uh, to produce uh, an estimate of the preference. And what we are doing is after learning the Bradley Terry model using the cross entropy objective, we are taking the estimate of R as our reward estimator. So it's a basically, it's, it's a quite convoluted way of doing things, right? You are, you're, you're, you're taking a, uh, an estimate that uh, tells you how likely is it that uh, Y1 is preferred over Y2 and you learn it from pairs and then you take this score that is actually uh, a pairwise preference score to do your ranking. I mean, this is a very standard way in pairwise ranking that you actually learning a score for pairwise, pairwise preferences, but then you use this score as a ranking score for for all your outputs. You are, you are no longer producing pairwise rankings. So, but that's, uh, that's uh, a model that has been uh, used for a long time and it has been recently be reintroduced in the machine learning community by Cristiano and they use it for robotics and produce nice results. So that's the state of the art in pairwise, using pairwise feedback and uh, we wanted to see how good that works. And uh, so what we see is in terms of uh, Spearman's row correlation with translation edit rate on uh, human references, there are the best results is it's a very low uh, correlation score of 0.23, but it's still higher for uh, the model trained on five point Likert scale feedback than for the model are uh, trained on pairwise uh, feedback. So that one, one, one conjecture could be, well, the data 
for five point normalized feedback is cleaner and the other one is the pairwise learning is harder because it's it's this convoluted setup of actually learning pairwise preferences and using them for directly scoring for the uh when you when you have five point feedback and you learn a regression model then you're learning what you're using in the end so it's a more direct approach okay now the final scenario now we are plugging in this reward estimator into end-to-end -end, uh, reinforcement learning so the idea is you want to tackle the arguable, arguably simpler problem of learning the reward estimator first and then use this reward estimator to uh, provide unlimited learned feedback and you basically can do offline online learning again you can basically use the same techniques that you always used for reinforcement learning by uh, assuming you get uh, unlimited feedback you're no longer getting banded feedback because you are using a reward estimator yeah? you not have to rely on the human to give you a one-point feedback you can reduce variance and get more feedback points from your reward estimator okay so the objective uh, is basically expected risk minimization from estimated rewards this is the objective here it's the expected uh, reward which is estimated from the reward estimator that we had before and uh, we use the uh, setup from Shen which basically is uh, the only the only difference to uh, standard reinforcement learning is that you are looking at more than one sample so you are you, you are sampling more than one output for 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 an input and you're averaging or, or taking the expectation over this and uh, you are not sampling over the whole output space but the, over a subset of the output space and you're renormalizing by the subset of the output space and then the other trick is that's also used in reinforcement learning is you're using a temperature parameter that allows you to lower the temperature and sharpen the distribution of your policy while learning so in the in the in, in the beginning you have a very flat distribution you are, you are treating all outputs the same and in the end you want to put a high all the probability mass on the most probable output and what we also do is we subtract the random average of rewards uh, to reduce uh, the variance and the bias yeah. so this is this is the, the scenario so we basically can go back to online uh, to online learning by using a reward estimator providing a lot of uh, a lot of rewards we can look at more than one sample at a time and uh, we still can use the, uh, the well-known and well-proven techniques from standard online reinforcement namely baselines or temperature parameters okay what are the results so again here we look at ted talks and uh, what we compare here is the results for uh, DPM. So that's the technique that we saw before, the deterministic propensity matching, where you take the rewards that you get at face value. You are not using a reward estimator at all. So the improvements we get is up to 0.5 improvement in blue. Then uh, the best result is gotten by expected reward that's er for a uh, five point feedback which is 1.1 blue improvement and which is much better than the 0.8 that we get from learning from pairwise feedback so this is basically so these results show that if you use human feedback noisy human feedback that did not work at all before in this uh, e-commerce scenario and you learn a reward estimator and you plug the reward estimator in reinforcement learning then you can get up to 1.1 blue in points in blue improvement for a neural a neural model that is trained on human feedback points of for 800 uh, translations so the, it, it, it's a very small number, a very small number of human feedbacks and you still can learn a reward estimator, use this reward estimator and get improvement. 
So it might be uh, conceivable that there are more situations like this where it really is easier to get uh, a thousand or more feedback points from humans, learn a reward estimator from them, and then use this to improve your translation system. Instead of collecting uh, translation from professionals and do the standard learning from references with cross entropy or make some likely. Okay. So that was basically all I had to say uh, to um, learning from uh, human uh, feedback and uh, just one slide on recent developments in sequence to sequence reinforcement learning. So most of the papers that you will see are in the area of simulate learning from simulated feedback. And the idea basically is you have a task and you have an evaluation metric. You can use this evaluation metric as reward signal and you can tune your system to get better results on this very evaluation metric by doing reinforcement learning. So there's a recent overview paper that uh, finds for every NLP application you can imagine for summarization and uh, machine translation and sentiment analysis and so on. If there are, are, are reward metrics, you, you use them in reinforcement learning and you get improvements by minimizing the exposure bias and by solving this problem that Cross entropy is a different criterion than rouge or blue, and you're optimizing towards that criterion. That's most of the work. There is some work on human reinforcement learning. So there's uh, one recent work by, by my group where we looked at uh, something in between reinforcement learning and imitation learning. So basically imitation learning means that you have an expert that uh, provides a gold standard trajectory, so a, a gold standard sequence, and uh, you use that sequence to learn. And the gold standard sequence that we are using is uh, an, uh, an output of a machine translation system, and uh, it's converted into gold standard by a human that tells you, here is an error, and here's an error, and here's an error. It's basically token-wise error markings. And, uh, that, uh, that idea has been reinvented at the same time by people working on robotics and uh, they call it differently, but it's, just, it's the same idea. You want to make sure that you get ex expert feedback that is more than one, one reward signal for a whole sequence, but it's less uh, costly than producing a full sequence. And uh, another way to go is uh, connecting human feedback to active learning. And uh, the idea here is uh, you use uh, the standard heuristics in active learning, namely, which are the data points that I need a user to annotate. You use reinforcement learning to learn this. And our idea was you're not only learning which data do I want to or do I need annotations for, but for which data do I need which kind of annotations. So maybe some data are easy enough that the annotation I need is only a reward signal or an error marking. And some data are so hard that I really need a full fledged uh, output signal that I can learn from. So that's, that's the direction our work is going at the moment. So connections to imitation learning, active learning, to improve our learning from human uh, feedback. And, but most of the work you will find is from simulated feedback. Just search for the word simulated or uh, evaluation metric in the paper. Then you will immediately see that whatever they claim is a real world or scenarios is actually what I would call a simulation. Real world means you're involving humans, even if it's hard and, and, and uh, to do so and costly, but this will be uh, the future to go. And so to summarize what we have learned, so it was a long lecture. We have learned the basics of reinforcement learning that can be found in standard textbooks by uh, 
doing policy evaluation and policy optimization for tabular scenarios with dynamic programming for uh, model free scenarios with Monte Carlo techniques or temporal difference learning. Then we learned the basics of policy gradient techniques and we saw how to apply policy gradient techniques to sequence to sequence models. And then we saw what if we don't want to use human references or uh, gold standard data to simulate our feedback, but if we actually want to elicit the feedback from humans, well, we have to go to offline learning and we have to uh, make sure that we get a good reward estimator. Reliable feedback, a good reward estimator, and then we can plug that into uh, an end-to-end -end system for uh, reinforcement learning. Then that's the last uh, time to ask questions and thank you very much for listening to me so far. Okay, uh, hi again. So uh, we got more questions in uh, the Q&A uh, window and most of them revolved about around uh, offline versus online learning and reward estimators. And uh, so Loic Dugast made a very good point. Can we use a reward estimator with online RL? And my answer was, yeah, that's exactly, that's the trick. If you do offline learning, you can, uh, in batches or from time to time, update your reward estimator and using the reward estimator, you can actually do online learning. You can do whatever is the best to do, what is the well, uh, is, is the, the most well-known scenario for reinforcement learning, namely online reinforcement learning. It's just that your rewards are delivered by a model that is updated from time to time. And Oh, my video is off. Okay. No. <laughs> should, should, should start now. So, uh, yeah, that would, uh, I think that's uh, a way of uh, turning offline learning into online learning that is not really uh, in the mainstream of the reinforcement learning research because people actually uh, don't have the problem that they have to do offline reinforcement learning. As I said before, mostly it's uh, if you if you want to do offline learning, you do supervised learning, and you will get your data from somewhere anyway. This is more not the solution that most people take. But if you really have to do offline learning, then that's a good way of uh, using the techniques for online learning by learning a reward estimator. And if you get a good reward estimator, then uh, you sometimes will get better results than using actual online rewards because you will uh, have lot, uh, less variance and uh, it's, it's a good thing. And it worked very well for us for machine translation. It was much better than using Blue's course directly, learning an estimator for Blue. Okay, so I see, unfortunately, we uh, have lost people over time. So maybe the last part of the lecture wasn't that interesting anymore, but uh, well, I hope. Uh, so please uh, let the organizers and the monitors know what you didn't like about it so that the lecture can be improved for, for next time. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a pleasure to answer all your questions. This is very helpful for me. I can improve things. And Lucy says, thanks. Yeah, I say thank you too. And I uh, hand uh, the word to the moderator, Fernando. Stefan, thank you very much for this great talk. You, as you said, it was a long talk, but it was really nice. Uh, I, people is actually saying about it. So uh, I guess that people have the, the lecture uh, in YouTube so they can go there later and, and catch the rest if they they were. And I think that may, most people is always is also 
uh, in a different time zone. So they don't uh, actually come at this time, but they, they will come later. But it was a great talk. And it was, uh, you covered ex, ex, actually very m much of the, uh, very everything, but basically about uh, reinforcement learning. So, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, let, let's hope that let's hope that next year we can get oh, together. Yeah, let's hope. And, yeah, yeah. And maybe maybe I can join tomorrow for this uh, Q and A with the with the monitors. I have to see. Yeah, I have a seminar in the evening. Yeah, it would be great. It, yeah. If, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much again, Stefan. Thank you. Bye. So, thank you, guys. Bye. See you.